Okay, great. Welcome everyone. And for those of you who are joining us here for the first time, welcome to Massey College. Massey College is built on land where many Indigenous people have lived. It is the treaty lands in the territory of the Mississaugas and the Credit of the First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Wendat and the Haudenosaunee peoples. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward the land and the great privilege that we have to work on this land. And in the context of this Massey Dialogue, I think it's particularly germane to acknowledge the disproportionate impacts of climate change for specific populations like Indigenous peoples of Canada, whose food systems, livelihood, and culture are deeply affected by it. My name is Jane Zhao, and I'm a third year PhD student studying health policy at the Dalana School of Public Health, and I'll be moderating today's session. While my PhD body of work focuses on primary care and health policy, I've become increasingly interested and involved in climate research in the past years. It's an issue that affects everyone, and in my opinion, one of the most important topics in, of research that we can take on. This is why I've gathered us here today to, to talk about the intersections of climate and aging. And though our topic is about specifically climate and aging, will likely span much broader than that, from ethics to political economy to social policy and beyond. So you're in for a great ride. We have two incredible leaders, scholars, and thinkers with us today, Dr. Ross Upshur and Dr. Ido Peng. We'll begin today's session by a bit of an introduction about climate change and aging, and then Ross will actually, um, and then Ross, Ido, and I will be in conversation for about 30 minutes, leaving us ample time at the end for questions. We'll have about 10, 15 minutes for questions from both people in the room as well as online. And finally, this massive dialogue exploring the intersections of aging and climate is held in partnership with the Collaborative Center for Climate, Health, and Sustainable Care. So with that, I'll ask Dr. Russ Upshur, one of our panelists, to give an introduction to the Collaborative Center. Thank you, Jane. It's a real pleasure to be with everyone today. So I'm going to very briefly uh, introduce the Collaborative Center for Climate, Health, and Sustainable Care. Uh, it's an EDUC within the uh, 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 ecosystem of the University of Toronto. We've just gotten started. We were launched in uh, November 2023, and it's a multi-fact faculty uh, academic unit that's an initiative of four of the health sciences faculties, the Dalalana School of Public Health, the Temerty Faculty of Medicine, the Lawrence Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing, and the Les Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy. And we're just getting started, so uh, anybody who wants to join us, I was going to say, because uh, I have our little two-pager here, <laughs> that you can <laughs> click on this to get onto the mailing list, but we're fortunate to have the uh, uh, Brittany McGuire here today, and if you want to join, she can provide you access to the uh, uh, mailing list. We're going to have three uh, foci of activity, three pillars. One is on education, and I'm heading up the initiatives to try to figure out our strategic planning around uh, um, uh, education. Quinn Grundy, who is the lead from uh, uh, the Faculty of Nursing, is heading up the research. And Fiona Miller, who's here, who's our fearless leader and the director of the <laughs> new uh, Collaborative Centre for Climate, Health and Sustainable Care, is leading the efforts around practice change. So we have great ambitions. Uh, and uh, everyone in the University of Toronto community is welcome to join us as we move forward in trying to find more sustainable solutions uh, for healthcare and dealing with the challenges of planetary health in the 21st century. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ross. So I just wanted to start with a few questions and a few remarks to set the stage for our discussion. Our changing climate has far-reaching impacts for everyone. It's a crisis and we're in it. I won't go over climate statistics here. They can be found more thoroughly in other resources such as the Intergovernment, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC reports, or the Lancet Countdown on Health and Climate Change website. More, frequent, more visible, frequent, and extreme weather events in the form of heat waves, droughts, floods, wildfires, and severe storms have and impacting our global populations. And governments around the world have had to respond to these varying impacts. Uh, displaced and forced migration, individual economic losses, repairing infrastructure damages, and resultant social and political conflicts. The cross-cutting effects of climate, change, of climate um, make it such uh, make it such a wide range of make it such that a wide range of actors and institutions must cooperate and work together to tackle these different wicked problems. 
Um, furthermore, the compounding impacts of climate change on health has been well documented. Um, more extreme and prolonged heat, cold, air pollution, the ins higher incidence of vector-borne and zoonotic diseases have all been changing our health and well-being of populations. And at the same time, the global population is aging rapidly. Both climate change and uh, the population aging are happening concurrently and key messages from a recent UN framework convention on climate change report highlights that one, older people have been neglected in studies from climate change and this neglect should be redressed in the context of the trend of aging populations everywhere. Older people furthermore are agents of change in, uh, for in actions for climate and although older people are a widely diverse group, many are disproportionately affected by climate change because of their greater physiological susceptibility, pre-existing health conditions, disability and social vulnerability, and particularly when they live alone uh, or in poor urban areas and are less capable of responding. So thus, old people, old, older people must be protected from climate-related results. And this report, as well as many other ones from the World Health Organizations and from other organizations, really highlight the, the key leadership that's needed to foster this type of policy change on a high systems level, and that the next 10 years will be critical for the agendas on both climate and healthy aging. So with that being said, we're, we're going to dive into a couple questions, and I'm going to ask, Ido and Ross to introduce themselves when they first um, speak. And can you tell us a bit about your projects related to these, this intersection of climate and aging? Ido, why don't we start with you? Sure. You want me to introduce myself first, yes, right? Yes. Okay. So I'm Ito Peng, and I'm a professor at the Department of Sociology and the Monk School of uh, Global Affairs and Public Policy. <laughs> it's a very long name. <laughs> um, and, and I teach um, uh, public policy and political sociology. So right now I am involved uh, in uh, three research projects. Uh, first one is, is um, a very large um, global partnership research project called the Care Economies in Context, uh, in which, which is funded by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada, as well as the Hewlett Foundation and Open Society Foundations. Uh, in this project, what we are trying to do is map out and calculate the shapes and sizes of care infrastructures and by that what we mean is both paid and unpaid care work that's been done in uh, sort of uh, that's been done in both formal and informal sectors and using this data to develop uh, gender sensitive feminist macroeconomic models of these care economies in nine different countries two in Africa two in Latin America three in Asia and two OECD countries um, my second project uh, is um, is called the Room Five of the uh, the Seventeen Room uh, Global Platform Project. Uh, what this is is a, a project that. Um, Run, uh, that's chaired by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Brookings Institute that tries to parallel UN 17 SDGs. And I've been co-leading Room 5, which represents gender equality, uh, uh, um, uh, gender equality in SDG. Uh, and so I've been doing this since 2021. Uh, in, in our room, what we, uh, my co-lead and I have been doing is trying to intersect uh, care with climate change. And what we're doing is focusing on the municipal and city level uh, in a policy and program innovations and experimentations and to see whether these ideas could scale up to other uh, uh, parts of the world. And then the third project um, relates to uh, a request from the um, Royal Society of Canada uh, as, uh, last year asking if I could put together a team of um, researchers, scholars and policy experts uh, to uh, sort of come up, develop a report uh, for on care and climate change policies. Uh, what we decided to do as a team is to actually develop a package 
of policy briefs and research notes that would intersect care and climate change policies. So that, these are the three projects that I've been involved in. I can't wait to hear more. <laughs> Great, yeah. So thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ross Upshur. I'm a professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and, and the associate director of the uh, a new collaborative center for climate health and sustainable care, representing the Temerty uh, Faculty of Medicine. I'm also a, so I'm a practicing family physician. I'm also a public health physician. So I'm also a professor in the Dalalana School of Public Health, where I'm the division head of clinical public health and also affiliated within the broader uh, university structure. I'm an affiliate member of the Institute for the History and Philosophy of Science and Technology, and a member of the Joint Science Center for Bioethics. So this nexus of aging, climate change, uh, and, and m intersects very well with my diverse interests over the, uh, my career. And not uh, uh, uncoincidentally, I've joined recently the ranks of older adults. So now I, now, I get to, <laughs> now I get to claim some ownership. So a lot of my clinical research was on older adults in primary care and uh, developing, implementing, and evaluating models of care to deal with increasing multimorbidity, polypharmacy, complexities uh, at the social uh, and medical interface. I've also done a lot of work in uh, environmental health and ecological health over the years. I won't go into that. But most the, the most important projects I'm working on now, one is the World Health Organization, and I'm a member of the Joint Center for Bioethics, which is a WHO collaborating center for bioethics. Uh, through the pandemic, I was the co-chair of one of the working groups on ethics and governance. And what they've identified, and it's coming out of the new work plan from the World Health Organization, is climate change is one of the big issues, mm -hmm. as uh, you know, Jane has pointed out, and I think as everyone in the room knows. So they're embarking on a series of case studies on ethics and climate change. And when I got wind of this, I said, you need one on aging uh, ethics and climate change. So I'm actually leading that project. Um, on a more technical level, uh, I'm, as I say, I'm uh, the division head of a division called Clinical Public Health, which is trying to break the solitudes between healthcare systems and public health to cre create greater integration. And one of the projects we had, which was a little passion project, was how is it that we can alert populations who are at risk from adverse health consequences on, you know, environmentally sensitive days, we'll call them. Uh, that would be adverse air quality when the AQHI, the air quality health index is high, uh, when heat exceeds certain thresholds, when it's cold, when pollen counts are out. So we developed a technique of working with uh, electronic medical records and primary care to send text-based alerts to patients at risk. And it kind of worked, uh, surprisingly. And now we're trying to build out a dashboard, a suite of information and alerts that can connect patients and uh, clinicians. Because oftentimes clinicians do not make the linkage between an adverse event in the uh, environment. Good example again, air uh, quality health index. It can be high on it for a couple of days, but the effects, the health effects are not immediate. They're often lagged. So clinicians and patients need to know so that proper diagnosis but also it's an opportunity, so this is the clinical public health part of it, there's an opportunity for prevention. You can educate patients to be alert to and aware of uh, those external factors in the environment that impact on their health and take proactive steps. So we're building that out. So that's what I'm doing in this space. That's amazing. Thank you both Ross and Ido for the breadth of the work that you're doing. And I think you know, oftentimes when we think about these issues, we start diving into solutions right away, right? We start thinking about, okay, well, what's the next action that we need to take and what, what problems do we need to solve? But I think this intersection of aging and climate is quite nascent and there isn't a lot of really good data or really good literature on it yet. And with only really a few landmark reports being published recently. So I think the framing of this issue is really important. And I, I wonder from both your different perspectives and backgrounds, Ross and Ido, if you could tell us a bit about how you think this issue should be framed. Yeah, thanks, Jane. So um, you mentioned to some, you know, there is a paucity of discourse, so to speak. Uh, but one really useful uh, document is that UN Decade of Healthy Aging. We are in the Decade of Healthy Aging from 2021 to 2030. But it's also tied, uh, subtitled, In a Climate Changing World. 
So I think this is a really useful report for framing some of the issues. And what I liked about it is they, you know, they, they talk about four pillars of activity. Mm -hmm. So one of the most important ones, and it, it relates to sort of normative discourse writ large, is you know, combating ageism. Uh, and I think that's uh, an incredibly important uh, dimension and they articulate all of the ways in which climate change and ageism interact because oft times uh, older adults are not thought of in plans to, for mitigation and adaptation. So the other point is they talk about age-friendly communities and this book links to the more intersectoral work that needs to be done in terms of the built environment. So one of the things we do know is that uh, uh, globally, older adults are at incredibly increased risk uh, during, uh, you know, heat, uh, uh, high heat days. And there's been no shortage of well-documented, this is where the research is clear and unequivocal, uh, as the heat goes up, uh, mortality goes up, and most of that mortality uh, falls upon older adults. And disproportionately, you know, in equity terms, uh, against different populations within that. And if you looked at the last IPCC report, they've got this, you know, scenario of what uh, world heat days are going to look like at one, two, three, four uh, degrees rise. And you will see that uh, what we now consider to be an extremely hot day is going to become the rule, not the exception, which means that we need to be proactively thinking about a multitude of ways of building, uh, you know, age friendly communities to uh, um, address the, the, those threats. One of the things that I like most in the UN report is they talked about the important, uh, importance of integrated primary health care. And this is something I feel very passionate about, not just as a primary care physician, but integrated primary health care talks about the integration of essential public health functions and primary health care across the spectrum of, you know, the classic uh, public health activities of health promotion, uh, health protection, and disease prevention. But the primary health care is about basic services and needs, and that aspiration that the WHO has come up with is to have primary health care available to the entire global population. And they also have a focus on long-term care, and we know there are problems in the long-term care sector if we want to become really local. Uh, if you've ever been in one, they don't often have the greatest uh, heating and ventilation systems, and heat stress is a common experience of people who, uh, older adults who live in long-term care. So as we're thinking now, you've heard the policy discourse, one of the ways to deal with the, uh, you know, increasing aging population in Ontario is to build more long-term care facilities. What a great opportunity to do that in a carbon neutral, sustainable way. And I think we need to advocate for, and, and all of the design architecture is there. We can use geothermal. There's lots of things we can use to build these, uh, you know, sustainable long-term uh, care. And as an advocacy point, why shouldn't we put some of our primary focus on building these sustainable health systems in the long-term care sector? I think our older adults are deserving of it and I may end up there soon. <laughs> so uh, I think that's a really, I think they've put, provided a really nice framing for it. Now what they don't get at are some of the issues, and maybe I'll just stop here and we can come back to it, are some of the deeper normative issues. Why should we care? Uh, what are the uh, kind of theoretical underpinnings of our under of our obligations to older adults, but I'll pass it over to Ito. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned about the, um, you know, UN's um, healthy aging sort of concept and the sort of four pillars of, uh, of activities because uh, it's kind of ironic, Nick, because as a political economist, <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm now sort of, refer I'm going to, I was thinking about in terms of the framing, uh, what WHO is, yes. has been uh, sort of um, uh, advocating, which is uh, the sense that uh, WHO since 2002 have uh, developed this notion of one health, uh, one planet, one health uh, concept. Basically, the idea is that, you know, the, the, the cl uh, human health, animal, plant, and the environment, including the ecology, uh, these are one system that are mutually interdependent on each other. And I really like that notion of interdependency uh, because when we talk about the aging uh, 
often, you know, what we think about in terms of the aging is a kind of demographic shift, the, the, the kind of dependency ratio, the, the cost of health care, mm -hmm. uh, long-term care, that kind of things. Uh, what we don't always think about is sort of ways in which the, the, the aging and long-term care, for example, really pr are premised on the idea of different kinds of interdependencies intergenerational interdependencies, uh, sort of societal interdependencies. So for us who, are st who come from the political economy background, for example, we look at care, and, and in this case, say, take aging and, and older people as an example, uh, we think of care in terms of the care diamond, where we, we think about care as not being sort of provided and sustained by single one unit, one person, but in fact it is a sort of care is a result of the kind of societal infrastructure made up of key societal, societal and economic institutions and actors. And four of the key, key institutional and, and, and actors and institutions are sort of the family, the state, market, and uh, community or the civil society. And that, you know, depending on which society you're in, which countries you're in, the, the, the proportion of these sort of, care, the, the weight of the responsibilities that, that the, say, care of the older people fall in depends on a different combination of these uh, four uh, institutions. But together, what we know is that no single institution, for example, family alone cannot you know, provide all the care for the older people. F uh, market cannot possibly provide all the care for all people. And so it is really that, so it, 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 what is really important is that kind of the, the organization and interdependent nature of all these societal and economic institutions and actors that come together to provide care and sustain the care system. And so um, I, I, I think of, you know, a climate change and care as uh, an aging society in terms of that kind of different kinds of interdependence. So take climate change, for example, you know, we know that, that climate change is a result of human activity, but human activity has real repercussions on the animal, the plants, the, the, the ecosystem. Um, and as, as you mentioned, Jane, you know, it impacts on all sorts of areas. And so um, we need to think of all this aging, climate change uh, as a kind of interdependent system in which we need to begin to reassess, you know, where are we at in terms of that interdependency now? And to rethink, you know, what, do, what kind of interdependent society, what kind of interdependent ecosystem do we want to achieve, that we, do we want to aim for in order to ensure the kind of sustainable a sort of healthy and, and, and inclusive kind of future. Uh, so the, the, my framing will yeah, be yeah, that interdependency. Yeah. You know, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that leads to sort of some of my uh, interests in ethics because mm. when we, you know, we need to start to explore uh, and utilize frameworks from ethics that are relational, that recognize interdependence, uh, that can bring us outside of, uh, uh, to use the technical term, our anthropocentric lenses. So mm -hmm. a long time ago, uh, uh, I did a lot of work in environmental ethics and tried to bring it with bioethicists, but the two discourses couldn't communicate with each other because most environmental ethics people thought that bioethicists were sort of like irredeemably uh, anthropocentric and couldn't get past human concerns. So what traditions of thought, what lenses uh, that recognize interdependence, not just humans interdependent with unhumans. Care ethics is great for that, you know, because it's relational uh, and 
you know, comes out of feminist theory, as you well know. <laughs> um, it's not focused on the, you know, uh, rational actor and the uh, isolated atomic human, but also other traditions of thought. And most of the reports, uh, including the Lancet Commission, as well as the UN, have pointed to the importance of tapping into and, and understanding uh, indigenous uh, uh, traditions of thought, which are, you know, founded upon this interdependence and this non-separation of humans from the natural world. So I completely agree with you. One health, interdependence, and we need to start articulating ethical frameworks that we can put into practice. It's a, it's a long game and we don't have a long time. Uh, but if we can at least make some inroads, at least in the educational sphere, uh, to sort of move in that direction, I think we'll be much better off. Yeah. Though I have no evidence to support that claim. <laughs> One yeah. can always hope, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, thank you so much. I think that that's really helpful, and it's brought up a lot of different points around, uh, I, I mean, you know, I really like that Kara Diamond, right, and thinking about all these different actors that are involved, and, and Ross, that discussion around kind of these normative discourses that come up over and over again, especially in these large reports and large commissions. And, and really kind of getting to the core of that. I'm actually gonna go off script for the next question because I think an important point that we might want to, I'm, I'm prompting you here, but I, I think an, an important point might be to take these different lessons and think about what might be some policy lessons, maybe from the long-term care sector, Ido, for you, or Ross from the SARS and COVID you know, epidemics, yeah. what might be some policy lessons that you could actually transfer or think about that might be really relevant for this climate and aging space? Hmm. Good question. <laughs> well, I think one of the policy lessons <coughs> that, that I think <coughs> that, that uh, um, I could think of is that in many ways, um, sort of the, as you started this conversation, you know, climate change, aging uh, have always been sort of seen as two two separate sectors right so uh, we we think of aging as a kind of demographic sort of social economic issue uh, in which people talk about you know pension and the, 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 the long-term care health care and that kind of thing and and climate change as a separate thing mm -hmm. and and I think uh, something that I have learned uh, in my work with the um, uh, uh, Room Five and and with the uh, Royal Society work is that 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 you you've got these two very very important sort of pillar of policy streams that are happening often not talking with each other, not, talk, not intersecting with each other. And, 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 and so it's really, really important to bring these two separate silos together. And I must say that that, that attempt is really difficult mm -hmm. because we really did try to do, bring you know, different uh, people from diff uh, the, the environment and, and, and the, the care sector together and often they couldn't even, they, they didn't even know how to even start the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I think for the policy, the, the, the importance of policy learning here is the sort of first really op sort of see, see clim climate change and Asian society as a kind of portal or the window to look at ways in which people could work together, the ways in which sort of multi-sectoral, interdisciplinary sort of uh, a, a approach can be actually actualized. So what it means in terms of the policy is really have people in the climate change policy field, you know, environment, biological, you know, natural science field, kind of uh, sort of begin to talk to social scientists, humanities people, historian, ethicists, you know, and, and really see uh, in, in what ways we can begin to really see that common, you know, common narrative, common uh, sort of project together. 
Right, so back to those interdependencies that you were talking yes. about, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so just picking up on, on, on Ido's point, I think there's um, much to, so, you know, there's these separate almost spheres that don't speak to each other. So I, I've worked a lot on pandemics and infectious disease outbreaks ever since SARS-1 in 2003. And uh, so in terms of learning lessons after Ebola, I wrote this grumpy paper that the only lessons we learn from pandemics is we don't like to learn lessons. <laughs> I'm not sure that COVID-19, which was an opportunity to sort of get all of those uh, discourses together. So we can't see the threats posed by pandemics as distinct from the threats posed by climate change. And of course, everybody's seeing artificial intelligence as the solution to both of these. And I work across all three and say, well, I don't think so. So um, that's one. One key lesson for policy that I've learned uh, in our work on pandemics came from a very interesting uh, uh, project we had funded uh, back just before uh, the 2009 H1N1 uh, uh, influenza outbreak. We had this great idea. We thought everybody's doing pandemic plans. You've got policymakers writing plans. You've got people who need to enact them. And then you have the populations affected. And the way that the CIHR had, uh, had framed this grant is that you needed to include vulnerable populations uh, in your group. So we thought, okay, great. So we went out and we gathered up, uh, you know, policymakers at the World Health Organization, Public Health Agency of Canada. We got them because there was actually no assurance that all of these different plans connected together in any way. And it's the same thing when we're doing, you know, climate uh, adaptation and mitigation strategies. Do they connect? across the world because we need to have a coordination. There needs to be some coherence there. And then we got the people who are supposed to act on it. So the, you know, the health professions that were gonna be doing this. And then we got the vulnerable populations together. We all sat in a room together you know, and at the, you know, for an hour to share our common learnings. And then we were gonna come out in plenary. And I uh, did a circle within a circle and the first group to speak were the vulnerable populations. And they looked at us and said, don't call us vulnerable. Whatever you do, do not call us vulnerable. Your policies, they said, pointing at the policymakers, are what makes us vulnerable. And if you don't think about our life worlds and their dimensions and how your plans are going to impact upon our life worlds, then there's a very good chance that the policies that you're putting in place to save us from the pandemic are actually going to make us more vulnerable and worse off. So since that time, I've been reluctant to use the word vulnerable. And of course, we're repeating that language in the climate change, right? Oh, vulnerable people. Who are the vulnerable people? Older adults. So, and why are they vulnerable? They're like this epidemiological subject because they're at higher risk. And that's as far as it goes. So we need to be, I think, a lot deeper and a lot more nuanced in terms of the language we use in policy documents, like go out and protect the vulnerable. Well, what does that actually mean? And have a lens and reflection about how our policy instruments may actually be responsible for making things worse mm -hmm. without a lens that's actually, uh, you know, informed by, you know, co-created, co-produced, that has people uh, who have, uh, whose fates are dependent upon this. That was another big learning, you know, nothing about us without us. And I don't see a lot of that in the global climate. Like, you know, we're going to, form our plan and then we'll give it to you. <laughs> so, so I think those were so like a real key learning from me was to be really attentive to the life worlds of the people who will be affected by policy decisions and have mechanisms for engagement uh, at every level. And I know that raises, a, you know, a lot of people don't want to, oh, that's too much time and effort, but I can assure you it will fail if you don't take those steps. Could I, th yep. This is really, really interesting because uh, so um, one, another, <laughs> another thing that, that, that I, you've got me thinking, uh, another thing that I think I really learned in, uh, in the last couple of years with trying to intersect care and climate is that hitherto my work has always been at the global level, mm -hmm. right? I, I work with the UN system, I work mm -hmm. with the, you know, ILO and all these things. And so my, my first impulse when I think about policy is like, oh well, climate change, global issue. Aging societies, global issue. And, and I'm thinking about this top-down notion. But over the la during the, my work with uh, Room 5, what we realized was some of the most um, interesting and 
important and effective policies were actually not coming from the UN and global institutions. They were coming from local city level sort of programs and projects. So let me just give you an, an example. We sort of just by chance happened to talk to the mayor of the Bogota in Colombia. She, back in five years ago, introduced this sort of new program called Manzana del Cuidado, which is what, what they call care, in English, it's a care block. It was, it's a sort of, city, it's, it's a city, small city level project that was really just aimed at uh, sort of providing respite care for mm. uh, women who are providing a lot of care for children, for elderly people. Uh, so to provide respite care for, for these you know, unpaid uh, sort of family caregivers, they started this small group of uh, care blocks it, it, by sort of using an underused sort of municipal buildings that are located in some, some sort of um, uh, public transport hub. Uh, so they started doing that. But then in process of providing that respite care, they realize that while they're having respite, these caregivers, their care recipients, like older people and children need care. So they started putting childcare and elder care uh, mm -hmm. sort of program aside while keep providing respite care for these people. And then they realize that, well, that's kind of, that's great, but these, these um, people, what, in, t in the process of doing respite care, they actually, what these women want to do is not just having conversation with other women and having tea with other women. They, some of them actually want to sort of learn new skills. And so they started providing skills development courses and then, you know, recreation courses. And then one by one, things kind of begin to sort of expand and next thing they know they realize you know in addition to respite care and the care for the older people and young children they should actually also provide health care services uh, while they're you know they, while they, they bring these people here and then they realize that you know in Colombia uh, women still do laundry every day you need to do laundry every day and not everybody have the laundry machine well so they 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 stop putting laundry machine to it so before you know it became almost like a shopping center for care services of mm -hmm. all sorts and then they realized that hey it would be really really great because local women are coming it would be really great to create have these care blocks located within 15 to 20 minute walk or bicycle ride from people's home. Uh, so they then began to integrate sort of urban planning of this, the, the, the accessible, you know, walk, walking friendly, uh, sort of low carbon uh, sort of access to these care blocks. Now they started with two care blocks five years ago. Now they have 20. Their hope is that uh, by 2030, there will be something like 26 of them across the, um, the city of Bogota. We, th that kind of local innovation and experimentation is what makes successful cases and, and models of, of this kind of integrated, you know, interdependent, services that address both climate and uh, aging and care. What we have done in our project is now, we have actually applied and got IDRC grant yeah. this year to scale Bogota's uh, Manzana del Cuidado by, uh, by adapting that to Freetown Sierra Leone because Freetown Sierra Leone's uh, mayor really likes this idea and, they, and she thinks that this will work in Africa as well. Uh, so that kind of l sort of lateral modeling across a group, but also this feeds up vertically 
by scaling this up. And so the, 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 I, I do know that uh, Colombia's, uh, Colombia last year introduced in their national constitution a sort of uh, uh, an act about the right to care and right to receive care. So I think that kind of policy experimentation that comes from bottom up and that, 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 that for which you could use existing concrete model to scale up vertically from local to national, but and as well laterally from one region to another. The Sierra Leone's you know, care block is not going to be the same as Bogota's, but it uses, it may adapt and apply similar kind of concept uh, to provide the kind of integrated care. Uh, so I think that's. So when that when are you bringing it to Toronto? Yeah. 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 <laughs> As you were speaking. But we yeah. are going yeah. to. We, we're mm -hmm. So, so one of the things that we did for the, that this uh, Room Five project is actually we have talked to lots of cities. We have now passed on the orga administrative organization to uh, this global NGO called Change. Um, care um, city hub and network for gender equity uh, it's th this this ngo is made up of the consortium of 13 global cities that includes london la um, bogota um, santiago barcelona and 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 many other cities toronto uh, so i have talked to the deputy mayor of Toronto about this. What we want to do is try to, to, to sort of create, sit, uh, so, so try to enlist some cities that are interested in this kind of project, uh, and Toronto is interested, mm -hmm. and create a, a, a community of learning labs. So we're trying to create learning labs to uh, to intersect care and climate change uh, in the, the, the cities that are interested in adopting this. Uh, so we're in this second phase of the project um, in which there's five um, other cities aside from Sierra Leone uh, that are interested in adopting uh, this model. Well, one of the things that strikes me as really um, possible within this model is enacting and enabling intergenerational solidarity, yes. right? Because you're bringing people across, and again, it's a life course uh -huh. uh, approach. It started out focusing on older adults, but we're, of course, all of us are aging. Uh, but bringing that, you know, one of the concerns when you read the literature is this notion of inter and intra-generational justice and concerns that, you know, our generation has uh -huh. uh, basically laid waste to the planet and the, you know, the next generation probably uh, doesn't owe us much on account <laughs> of it. But so this, these notions of uh, intergenerational solidarity of bringing, I think can be enacted through that kind of model. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important. Yeah, I mean, as both of you were speaking, what a visionary you know, model to, mm. and I, as, as you were speaking about that, I was thinking a, very much from an envious position in Canada, right? I think that's where I was saying, well, why are you bringing it to Toronto about this idea of being able to really scale that up and mm -hmm. really have this actually enacted and, and in a constitution, right? Uh, have it at this highest, highest level of policy and then have both this bottom up but top down approach as well. Um, and then, you know, something that's come up over both of your comments is, is this idea around the money that goes in to fund this and perhaps the structures within, whether it's the Canadian Institutes of Health Research or IDRC or other grant agencies that need to be able to think about all these different actors that need to come to the table in order to do this work and do this work properly, right? That relationship aspect, but then making sure that that representation is there so that Ross, as you were saying, right, nothing without us, nothing about us without us. Um, I think, you know, thinking about these different pieces and thinking about the many different aspects of the work that you've done, can you tell us maybe about something that's surprising that's come up from your work or something that um, you didn't quite expect but is kind of either coming up from the process of the work that you're doing or the actual results? 
Well, I think, uh, well, not so much a surprise, but for me, one of the biggest challenges uh, in doing this, um, because my, so I'm, I'm now lumping together all my three projects, but so my project involves kind of uh, having, um, uh, the, the, it's, it's a global project that involves Africa, um, Latin America, Asia, and 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 OECD countries. Context really matters, and and um, and 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 we have to be really mindful about uh, sort of different norms, different histories, and different perspectives mm -hmm. on even the notion of care and climate change, right? So I, I, I actually just came back from Nairobi uh, about a week ago where I met with my uh, two, um, two African teams. Um, my two African teams are one in Kenya and one in Senegal. And one of their biggest challenges for the last three years uh, has been trying to come up with Pan-African feminist post and decolonial uh, per, uh, perspective on care and the care economy and how do we deal with the climate change. And so we have spent a whole week again sort of talking about how do we understand you know this sort of post, post and decolonial perspectives on, on, on care. And what I'm learning from them is that what I understand as what makes good care, what, mm. you know, how care should be provided, uh, who should be providing, and in what configuration, mm. it's not, it like, does not apply to everybody. And, and so they were also, so their big, big struggle is, you know, sort of, uh, believe it or not, Africa mm. is uh, has now. Uh, uh, Africans are worried about uh, their. They, they know that their past um, demographic dividend. It's still a very young co continent, but they know the number of pe people who are over the age of sixty is c something like triple in the next, you know, thirty years, and so uh, they're really worried about long-term care. Uh, but how do we provide long-term care, and who should be provide? That is such a big issue for them, and they do not want. Um, they do not want to duplicate nor do they think it, you know, it makes sense for them to simply adopt the kind of care model and care ideas that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's been a big challenge. And I think for me, that uh, shouldn't be a surprise, and yet it was a surprise and mm -hmm. challenge and something that we're still sort of uh, work, trying to work through. Um, there isn't the right solution but maybe in the process of working through this, that we could kind of really learn about, not just about African sort of care model, but also reflectively learning, by learning African care model, I think I might be able to learn more about our North American care model that I, did, I simply assume as natural. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what, what surprised me most when I first started to draw these threads together was the comparative void uh, at that intersection of aging, climate change, and ethics. Uh, to the point, as I was mentioning earlier, we had tried to get a grant focusing on it uh, a couple of years back, and people said, well, that's not, you know, why? What's interesting there? <laughs> so, so either I'm barking up the wrong tree, but I don't think so. Uh, but what surprised me is the absence of concerted attention, mm -hmm. given that these are massive uh, pressing drivers, uh, not just on health systems, but on uh, member states, social systems. And so we need to rapidly, I think, bring these together and have a productive uh, discussion about how we're going to proceed. And it's, I've heard some really interesting ways of going forward today, which is really nice, which I can advocate for, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's really wonderful. Thank you both. I think 
and, uh, and I'll ask you this one last question and, and then we'll turn to audience questions. But if you would leave the audience with one message about climate and aging, what would it be? And I'll, I'll challenge you to do this in two sentences. <laughs> Russ. Oh, thank you, yeah. Um, well, I think it's actually contained in the, I'm just looking for uh, uh, the, the language used in one of the reports that uh, really there's, uh, y you know, you can't, you know, healthy aging is not possible without a healthy planet, is one. Mm -hmm. And we cannot proceed without uh, engaging with older adults. Mm -hmm. There's a wide number of reasons why we would want to, that's more than two sentences. Um, I'll stop there, yeah. <laughs> Rather than giving the laundry list. So, yeah. Uh, we can't, we cannot, ad we cannot ad address climate change without engaging Ah, oh, look, climate action cannot succeed without older people. There you, oh, go. Yeah, there you go. The title <laughs> of our talk. The title of our talk, yeah. That's my takeaway <laughs> message. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Well, I don't know. After you, you would be hard. I would say, I, I would say you know, uh, we remember different kinds of interdependencies. Climate change and aging population are the are most effective and powerful, uh, most effective and powerful portal to understand and reassess different forms of interdependencies. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Both and we got for the musical accompaniment. I know, and, and yeah. we, have, we have musical accompany <laughs> yeah, in the background. Yeah. We're not sure if folks online can hear that, and hopefully not. Yeah. Um, so with this, I'll, I'll open it for the audience uh, online and in the room. If anyone has any questions, we have both the mic as well as uh, people who can uh, follow it around a mic. So yeah, why don't we go Peggy and then up to Noah. Hi. Is it one? Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you so much for that wonderful talk and it was very insightful. Um, I do have a question. It's, I hope it's not too lengthy. Um, so I want to kind of um, focus on something that you mentioned that uh, our policies making us worse, right? And I want to situate that in the space of long-term care homes because that's where my research is. Um, I'm a postdoc at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation, looking at the physical and psychosocial environments of long-term care homes. I'm also a landscape architect. Um, so in long-term care homes, that is highly risk averse with a huge focus on fall prevention and infection prevention control. Uh, we know that the mechanical system is often imperfect, but they do rely a lot on it. And the staff cannot keep the doors open because it will throw off the mechanical systems. And they also cannot open the window wider than a couple of inches. So that leaves very little fresh air in these homes. Now to exacerbate this problem, majority of the doors in the courtyards or to the outsides are locked and not enough staff are there to assist older adults to get outside. And the microclimate in those courtyards are often too windy, too cold, too hot, too sunny. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why they, uh, they can't bring them outside. Now for the homes that are underway, to maximize the very little funding that they have to build long-term care homes, they try to squeeze the most they could, right? By building these mega homes that are 300, 400, 500 beds. Um, so with that, that comes with barriers to going outdoors. So as you can imagine, because we're building up, this vertical nature of these homes um, could cause more problems. So we know that um, this is a problem because we also know that in research, access to going outdoors to the natural environment impacts our health outcome. Um, outdoor spaces are built uh, currently. So now I'm putting on my landscape hat. Uh, so these outdoor spaces are built not as a network of uh, landscapes that could potentially help with the environmental solutions that we could have to address climate change. Um, instead, the quality of the environments vary across long-term care homes. I've been to more than 30 of them. Um, so by variation, I'm talking about concrete pads as the outdoor space to really beautiful gardens, right? So the variation is wide. So here's my question. <laughs> what might you suggest in terms of funding and collaboration that often overlooks the impacts or the benefits of these outdoor environments for ecosystems, 
for biodiversity, soil retention, cooling and shading effects that we could have from trees. Um, so what kind of collaborative efforts could there be and help with funding to make these outdoor environments more accessible and more contributing to, um, I guess, more environmental benefits? Yeah. So I, I think it's pretty straightforward, the answer to that. Uh, one, stop abusing older people by, you know, warehousing them. We've learned that in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, one way to sort of come around that, and I'm, I mean, I'm not a policy guy and I have no idea where the money comes from. I sort of do. It comes from tax revenues. And, and who are the residents of the uh, long-term care homes? There are relatives and citizens. Uh, 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 so it's a priority and resource allocation issue. If we care, if we care about older adults and we care about the climate, we would be designing, uh, you know, long-term uh, care facilities uh, that were, you know, innovative, forward-looking, green, uh, offered the health benefits that you've articulated. Um, so that takes advocacy, right? So when we start to see these great big warehouses coming up, we got to say no. That's 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 not 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 the way we want to go, um, and you know we've got the capacity to vote out governments that uh, support these. Um, and you, as someone who's at this interface, you know you can advocate. What about a design challenge? You know, so even if we're going to build up, are there ways that we can build up that include? green principles. So I worked for a long time at Bridgepoint, which was designed to be a green building, and it's a beautiful facility. Uh, so we, we have the wherewithal, we have the know-how to do this, we just have to care enough to allocate the resources to do it. And failure to do so tells you everything you need to know about how we think about aging populations and older adults. It's, it's classic ageism at the architectural <laughs> level, right? So I think, you know, we've got to get proactive and advocate. Because you know, you know there's better ways to do it, right? Yeah, I, I, that's latent in the question that you posed. So I have a slightly different answer, and it comes in two, part, uh, two parts, kind of funny. One is uh, sort of, I really want to trouble uh, that, that systems, policies, health, uh, okay, long-term care policy system architecture itself. Uh, meaning that, you know, one of the problems I think, uh, so sort of that, that, that you're raising about long-term care homes, uh, is that that it's a kind of last resort sort of dumping ground for the people who can take care of themselves, right? And and it's what really amazed me, uh, and I have done research on this uh, within the OECDs, Canada has one of the highest institutional rate for long-term care of OECD countries. And we are relatively still very young country compared to countries like Japan or South Korea, right? The, the reason is that we, we, although a lot of people talk about the, the importance of the continuum of care for older people, we don't have the continuum of care because our system is kind of divided either in social welfare for which you get maybe care for the some kind of personal you know PSW care for some people based on your income level and then there's a gap and then health care right and there's no system of long-term care uh, and I think the problem is that what it does is it, because there's no continuum of care, people are not provided with care from early stage all the way to when they really, really need long-term, like institutional long-term care. If you look at Japan or South Korea, they, you know, Japan right now, nearly 30% of their population is over the age of 65, right? They've been dealing with aging society since 1990 when I was still teaching there, they introduced, you know, national long-term, mandatory national long-term care insurance. I've been saying that to ca Canadian government ever since I came back to Canada. It's like, we need national long-term care insurance. But the moment 
I use the word insurance, people kind of go, whoa, no, insurance is bad. And I keep saying, no, this is tax funded, national, you know, mandatory social insurance, just like what OHIP used to be, what just like healthcare insurance used to be. That's what we need. If you look at the long-term care system in Japan or South Korea, you get long-term care insurance service from the moment that you need any kind of small care services. If you're over the age of 65 or if you're over the age of 40 and experiencing age-related disabilities. So you could get services from at-home services that range that, that keep going to community-based services to finally, you know, when when, when you absolutely need 24-hour institutional care, you get in that, that, that institutional care. The institutional care rate in Japan and South Korea, very low, because most of the people are uh, uh, receiving care at home in the community and all those and so what I'm saying is that we don't need to lock them up in the long-term care homes you know in these locked rooms uh, because we could provide if we could provide care much earlier on the continuous basis it's not only going to be financially fiscally much cheaper but it's also much better for people's health. I think that's what I think. So that's one thing. We don't even need to address the question of that kind of quality of air in the, the long-term care home, like because very few people end up in there. So that's my first thing. So that's system policy kind of uh, sort of answer. The other thing is, so, so in terms of the, so you, you mentioned about urban planning and, and architecture, like actual physical architectures. There are a lot of very interesting uh, policy programs that different cities and countries have, have uh, introduced. For example, many cities in Latin America and, and, and also in, in uh, Europe have introduced such thing called, you know, the heat officer. These are the municipal or city level uh, officers whose job is to keep, sort of alert people, keep track of when the, the heat rays up um, and, and what needs to be done, provide information, provide infrastructures for people to deal with. In the, I, when I talked to the deputy uh, mayor of Toronto, I said, well, you know, that kind of, it's a simple municipal level policy that could be implemented. And she said, oh, you know what, in the case of Toronto, maybe what we need is not just heat officer in the summertime because we're beginning to see, but cold, yeah, cold officer as well. So temperature officer might be something that we need. That kind of very pragmatic, you know, sort of infrastructure, like, a uh, human resource infrastructural kind of policy could be implemented at the municipal level. Another very sort of simple, low-hanging fruits uh, comes from example of South Korea. Seoul, Seoul, has, Seoul city government has introduced this, uh, has provided this reflective white paint mm -hmm. on top of the buildings, all the municipal buildings daycare centers, schools, hospitals, and long-term care homes, institutions. I mean, it's cheap, it's, and, and they provide it free, and it's a heat reflecting, it's energy saving, but then also providing cooling systems. So, cooling systems. So, you know, there are a lot of really interesting examples that could, that, from different places that we could adopt and, 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 and use uh, in, in Canada as well. So that's just two answers. Thank you so much. Um, Michael, do we have any questions online first, Joe? No? Okay, great. So we have two more questions in the room. Why don't we take them both and then we'll try to answer both and then we'll wrap up. Thanks. Okay, um, good evening. My name is Otto. I'm a junior fellow here and I missed the earlier part of the conversation because I was coming from class. So my, my question is um, two-pronged. How serious and how just can we get about climate change 
And let me, let me give some context to my question. So how serious can we get? Um, we talk about COP28, COP29, all of that. And then we see the thousands of people that fly to these events, you know, and um, we know the carbon footprint that is left with, you know, flying all of, all of those people to those venues and, of course, the waste that will come out from, from events like that. So how serious are we going to, are we supposed to get about climate um, change? And, and, and then how just can we get about climate change? I like the fact that you bring up Africa. I'm African, I'm Nigerian. My problems are African, I think African. Now, we are talking about climate change and all of that. There's a lot of extraction going on, crude oil and all of that. And most of this is done by companies owned by the West. Now, it, it makes you think about um, new colonial ties to some of these things. Does climate change only affect people in the West? What about my people back home? And then we talk about renewable sources of energy, lithium and all of that. You have to extract that. We have lithium in Nigeria. We have Western companies coming to extract this lithium. And you need to make um, rechargeable batteries and all of that, which is a renewable source of energy. But it causes another problem for the environment through extraction. So how serious and how just do we need to get about climate change issues? Thanks, Atuto. Just some small questions for the end. Um, Noah? Hi there, um, Noah Khan, junior fellow here at Massey College. Um, and my question is essentially, like, could you locate this conversation in context of sociocultural imaginaries around uh, older people and climate? Um, and what I mean by that is the media narratives that we tell about older people, um, the conventional expectations of the types of emotions you're supposed to have in relation to older people or in relation to climate, um, just in terms of maybe providing insights into, for instance, if somebody's working in the humanities like myself, and doing sociocultural work, um, what that might look like, or what are kind of good paths forward uh, for that type of work. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay. So I have a two word answer. How serious? Very. Uh, how just? <laughs> as just as possible. Um, and you know, hearing you know our, our, our focus today wasn't on sort of the uh, broader issues around our own. Uh, commitments, uh, you know, lots of things we can do academically to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, with respect to your, uh, you know, observations around uh, the inequitable distribution of the burdens of climate change, mm -hmm. you know, it's very clear, uh, it's been well established that the uh, carbon footprints of high income countries uh, and their extractive behaviors uh, have had impacts on uh, other parts of the world disproportionately and perhaps unjustly. And you know the reparations and damage fund is a is a small little uh, gesture towards uh, uh, redressing that. But those are points well taken and points that need to be uh, integrated into our thinking uh, along these uh, uh, paths. So, Andrew. yeah, yeah, I, I was going to say very similar. It's important, and we have to do it now. I think, I mean, what you're raising is a really large global political sort of tension, right, between sort of sort of the, the un, unequal distribution of resources and extractions and, 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 and sort of development strategies. I think, uh, I think those are the kind of issues that we really have to deal with that we have not actually seriously dealt with. Um, you know, that even COPs COP28 uh, sort of issues got raised, but uh, it sort of stays at that debate level and, and, and not in a kind of serious sort of re, uh, redressing sort of solution. I think, I think for me, sort of, as someone who, is, who lives in Global North, I think, you know, one of the things that we uh, that, that I would like to continue sort of thinking is that is that I believe that we could each do something, even little things, you know, in our everyday life, to ensure sort of low carbon footprint, to ensure sort of that 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 climate justice happens, and it is you know it is one thing to go, you know go to COP. 28 and kind of yell at each other and, and say we, we have to do something about this we have you know there has to be some kind of global compact on you know the, the, the climate uh, justice 
But I think what often we forget is our everyday practice that in everyday life, you know, small things, even like how much are we, you know, recycling, how much are we reducing, you know, carbon footprint, that kind of everyday personal commitment to the practice is what makes, I think, ultimately make difference. So I guess what I'm saying is that we need to do immediate personal thing, you know, action, as well as sort of trying to advocate at the global level. Um, in terms of the sort of uh, your question about the, 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 the um, sort of collective in imaginaries about, yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, in, it's a very difficult and in interesting issue because th that kind of collective imaginaries about aging, about what is care, you know, what is our vision of the society. Uh, I think at one point, sort of, at, at, at one level, we know sort of that, uh, that there's difference in societal, sort of among societies in terms of that collect, collective vision, collective imaginaries. But I also believe that those collective imaginaries and narratives change over time. And so, when I think of culture, and I think of culture as not a static thing, right? It is, culture is a, is a moving, evolving, uh, sort of evolving thing that, that, that evolve as we practice that culture. Uh, so I'm both hopeful uh, in that, you know, as, as our, ideas change as our practice change and as our practice change informed by policy, you know, incentives and policy tools that, that our culture and our society will change. But that evolution is going to be very slow. It's not going to change tomorrow or next week, but I'm, I'm hopeful that it will change over time. And just uh, to sort of build on that, um, I think there's huge opportunity for humanity scholars uh, in this space. We're hoping to get a, a grant funded that brings, you know, poets, artists, philosophers, and social scientists, as well as healthcare uh, uh, researchers, to talk about what is a realizable utopia for aging in the 21st century. So we've got some interest. So that's uh, you know all sorts of discourses, uh, you know, to be. Uh, uh, looked at and countering negative narratives and all sorts of things. I think there's huge uh, opportunity there. Wonderful. And, and with that, we're very over time. So thank you all for being here. Um, I, I failed in my timekeeper taskmaster <laughs> task, but um, we hope it was a, an illuminating session and we hope that it'll ignite future work and discussions. The session is being recorded and it'll be posted on the Massey College YouTube channel. And again, the session is also in part a, a, sem a seminar series by the Collaborative Center for Climate, Health and Sustainable Care. There's an upcoming event for the center that's coming up on March 20th. So climate and ecology and education, transforming learning for a hopeful future. So join Dr. Carlos Pimienda, um, Dr. My Maria Milopoulos, and Ashley My Imone for this important discussion. And Brittany can post the information for this. And thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.